We have with us uh, Dr. Bittu, uh, and uh, they um, are a PhD in neuroscience. And, uh, you know, as I mentioned, we have really like just titans of uh, their industry over here. And from Dr. Bittu, what I really do want to know is what is the importance of, uh, you know, establishing that that education of, of uh, being in those classrooms and, and talking to kids who might go on to be future psychologists, who might be future mental health professionals. Um, what has that experience been like for you, uh, sir, if you could just let us know? All right. Um, uh, as, uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm in classrooms with both um, psychology students and biology students. Uh, of course, uh, in India, biology students don't usually go on to become medical professionals because they're uh, doing MBBS at undergraduate levels. Uh, so I guess I, I have a chance to at least talk to some medical students here today. Um, but of course, lots of people um, in my classroom go on to be psychologists. Um, I uh, sort of largely teach neuroscience. So um, I try to explain to um, students how the brain works in general, and therefore how an understanding of gender emerges from the brain. Uh, a lot of uh, medical professionals also sometimes forget, uh, you know, that, um, that the brain is, is a you know, biological organ, right? It's part of the body. Um, and, um, you know, uh, often uh, the phenomenon of being trans is relegated to the realm of um, or people say this is something to be a psychological issue here, right? As in, they seem to think that something which is psychological, sort of have me here, right? That it's something that's sort of in the air, um, and don't realize that it emerges from a biological organ, which is not very different from other biological organs in the body. Um, so when I teach, I try to, uh, you know, among other things, explain how brains produce behavior. Um, and therefore, if you identify as a cisgender person who uh, identifies in some sense or doesn't strongly not identify with the gender assigned at birth, that behavior emerges from uh, the ways in which your brain has been shaped um, developmentally and the ways in which it interacts with the structure of gender in the world. And if you're a trans person uh, who does not identify with the gender you were assigned at birth, likewise, that behavior emerges from um, the development of your brain and the interaction of you uh, with your brain and uh, with, with the environment. Uh, now, um, uh, uh, you know, therefore, if there is, you know, one of the things that, um, uh, that, uh, you know, we're still getting a handle on is sort of what the exact neural correlates of trans identity may be. But I don't think one needs to wait for that to happen in order to recognize that if all behavior is produced by neural activity, then if there is a behavior, there is a neural basis to that behavior. And in some sense, the, uh, you know, evidence of the neural basis of that behavior should not be necessary for people to understand that there is therefore a scientific basis um, to, uh, to gender identity. Now, the question of course is, we think of biological sex as um, uh, you know, uh, relating to the body, uh, but also relating to the brain, right? So we, we have a sense of the ways in which brains are shaped um, by, um, uh, by or, or influenced by biological sex, not hugely, surprisingly, actually there, if you, if you look at male brains and female brains as, as, they, as they're biologically classed, one actually finds fewer differences than one, one might expect. Uh, but to the extent that one um, uh, finds any differences, uh, the, the question really is how much of what we think of as gender is socially constructed uh, and how much of it you know, emerges from say genes. Um, and that's also a difficult question to answer. So it's another example of a question that we're not at a stage, um, uh, at a state where we can answer in the field. We can't answer in the field, not because we don't have the tools, but because as long as there is a social construct of gender, since brains are an example of an organ, unlike uh, uh, some others where, where sort of every interaction with the world, every memorable interaction takes the form of, of neural remodeling, right? So of, of changes in the ways in which neurons connect with each other in the brain. So physical, the hardware of the brain changes with social interaction. And therefore social structures such as gender and several other social structures, caste, class, and so on, become encoded in brains, right? They, they, they shape and influence brains. And therefore, as long as you have a social construct around gender, you are going to have neural correlates of um, those social structures. And it's going to be very hard to tell what behavior that is gendered in any way, right? What uh, is even conventionally cisgendered, uh, how that um, uh, relates uh, to the, the social construct of gender 
versus biological bodies. And remember, the social by, when I say the social construct of gender, which is not a term that's generally familiar to doctors uh, uh, and not taught, uh, even though it must be taught, because as neuroscientists, we understand that if the brain is constantly remodeling in response to uh, interaction, which includes social interaction, then it becomes very difficult to understand the functioning of the brain if one is thinking uh, you know, in the absence of understanding social structures. So what does it mean then for gender to be a social construct? One means that we, we all have bodies. We go to extraordinary lengths to cover up our bodies when we're around each other. And yet you have a social system in which before I even refer to you uh, or give you a pronoun, I have to think what your body looks like. And uske adhar pe, I'm going to refer to you as he or she, which sounds like an extremely disrespectful thing to do in the first place, which is why, uh, you know, um, pronouns are so difficult for a trans person as a trans person I can explain what that uh, what that experience is like um, not all trans people experience this but I experience uh, what's called dysphoria which is um, which uh, you know um, uh, is a disconnect uh, so I experience physical dysphoria which is a physical uh, sort of uh, disconnect from um, at least secondary sexual characteristics in my body and um, if you, uh, you know, again, a lot of um, people who aren't trans will find this very difficult to understand. So I, I, I'll try and use um, uh, a tool to, to, to convey what this is like. Um, so if you close your eyes and you raise your hand, right? Um, even if you can't see your hand, you have a mental map of where your arm is, right? You have a sense of where your body is, right? Even if you're not looking at it. And that's because your brain generates an expectation of your body uh, from years of somatic of sort of sensory input, so you know, you're, with your arms raised, then uh, you know you uh, the the nerves that are but that that are adjacent to your own muscles are sending feedback to to the brain, but that feedback in some sense makes sense uh, to the brain or is interpreted by the brain based on um, uh, uh, you know um, pre-existing biases and how uh, um, uh, brains interpret sensory touch information. And of course, there's touch information, there's visual information, there's multi-sensory information about your body. Now imagine you wake up tomorrow and you have this whole body where, where you know you have a sense that I have, you know I have two arms, and you wake up tomorrow with an extra arm, right? Now you I you can think of this in two ways. Either you wake up with an extra arm from which you're not getting any physical input, right? So it's there on your body, but you're not feeling it, and it feels very strange to have something on your body that's that that you're not expecting. Or you have an arm that is giving you input, but you spent your entire life as a person with two arms. And so you're not like the, the, the sensory input from the third arm is just, I mean, it's just a constant distractor, right? So you're trying not to think about it, but it's unexpected sensory input. So any unexpected sensory input makes its way into your sort of attentional circuitry into, into your conscious perception of, of the world. And so you would like to not spend the entire day thinking about your extra arm. It's really not interesting or relevant, right? To your day-to-day -day life. But there it is giving you unexpected sensory signals, right? All day. Uh, and that in some sense is an, is a sen gives you a sense of what physical dysphoria is like, right? So I, for example, uh, expect as a trans man, uh, which, which describes the ways in which I relate to my body, that I have a flat chest, right? When I get sensory input that contradicts that, uh, right? It's just jarring, it's disturbing, it's surprising, right? It's, it's like somebody suddenly turning on loud stereo multiple times a day. It forces its way into my attention, uh, atten attentional space, even though I don't want it to. So it's hard enough sort of being in a room by oneself. But if one goes outside that room and one interacts with people, including doctors, and doctors are then looking at your body up and down to try and decide what you are and what they should do with you, then that's just going to make your dysphoria worse, right? And of course, it's hard enough interacting with people in general, one can try and cover up, but when one goes to a doctor, there's no covering up, right? You're taking your body to them. And uh, often doctors also have a sense of entitlement around trans person's bodies, which is very invasive. Um, and, you know, people think I'm a doctor, so, you know, you've come to me because you have a stomachache, but I can still figure out what the rest of your body looks like, right? So that invasive kind of, um, the, the combination of those things makes almost every trans person I know really unwilling to see a doctor right you get a, a uti you're drinking gallons of water before you're like okay it's so bad that i absolutely have to go to a doctor right you have kidney stones you just wait until you absolutely can't bear the pain before you go to a doctor so the, the simple thing that i would say as a doctor is to, is to perhaps understand how this um this experience is for a trans person when any person comes into to the hospital ask them what uh, name and pronouns they're comfortable with 
and treat them in that way. And if you need to then, if, uh, and you know, really only ask, it's very important to ask for consent before um, examining any part of anyone's body, I think, even as a doctor, even though that kind of medical ethics is very rarely taught. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, make sure you're not sort of violating uh, somebody's, uh, you know, just because they've come to a doctor doesn't mean that they're giving you license to kind of say, oh, you know, I, I would like to see what kind of gen genitals you have or whatever else. And I've had any number of, of trans friends who've gone to the doctor, just be stripped by doctors, other doctors are called in to view the show, you know, this is the kind of thing that's happened with several trans friends of mine, and then it becomes very, very difficult to convince them to go to the doctor even when they when they really need it. So, uh, so, uh, so ask for consent when uh, ask whether people are comfortable. Um, I've been to a, uh, I've and, and I've taken people to a few trans friendly doctors who are really good with this. Uh, right, they're sensitive to the fact that uh, that it's difficult to to live with a, a body uh, as a trans person, and even harder to go to a doctor with such a body. Um, and of course, uh, remember that trans people have both uh, medical needs which are trans related and medical needs which are not trans related. If there are medical needs which are trans related, um, you know, I'm sure many of you are already familiar with a lot of these, but I'm happy to provide, uh, you know, at some point, if, if that's uh, deemed appropriate in the flow of this conversation, more information about what kinds of um, uh, medical needs uh, trans people, gender affirming specifically medical needs trans people may come to you with. Um, I would also strongly suggest that one not think of it as treatment, right, because it's not as if one is in some sense sick and needing treatment. Um, and uh, to, to really just think of this um, as um, gender affirming uh, procedures. 